I'm gonna try something different today. Usually when I make a video about a project, I work on the entire project, I, I film parts of it, and then I film myself talking to you about the project and edit it all together. That's usually how it goes. But this time, I kind of want to make this video before I actually finish the project. I don't know, I just feel like it'll be interesting to kind of catch my feelings and thoughts of this before I finish and then after I finish and we'll see how it goes. So I, this is a project that I'm very excited about. It all started really months and months ago. I think I can trace it back to the summer or maybe even before that. If you've been following me for a while, you know that I am very, very into the 1920s fashion and styling and just like a lot of things related to that era and there's this huge party that happens every year in new york city called the jazz stage lawn party which is like the best thing in the world for me i i go almost every year with my husband we i make i've made outfits and show you how to do that and he also loves it and is into it and he usually wears the same outfit for the past three times that we've been to it. It's actually an outfit that he wore at a play like years and years ago. But he's been saying like, I wanna wear something different. I wanna, would you mind making me something for next time we do it? Immediately, of course, my mind just went racing and of all the different possibilities. And I thought it would be very fun if I were to make him like a golfing 1920s type of outfit, you know, where the fair aisle, sweater vest type of thing and then the you know kind of old-timey golfing pants naturally i would i thought i will knit you a best that's the first step uh even if it's not for next year or for who knows when but just in general having like that type of fair aisle sweater vest would be great for your wardrobe so i started doing research and as always i, I started hitting kind of like this wall where there aren't there's just not that many men's patterns out there in general i don't know why i always have a hard time every year i make him a sweater that's kind of my thing it's always so hard to find sweater patterns that i that i like i even looked for vintage patterns i couldn't find quite what i was picturing and then as i was going through ravelry i found this picture and i was like oh my god this is this is it. This is, this is what I was thinking. This is exactly what I wanted. Very colorful, but at the same time understated, like the, the brown behind it and the types of color work themselves, like the, the shapes they're creating, everything about it was just like, this is what I want. And then I looked closely at the actual pattern. The name was Prince of Wales uh, Slipover, I think. You know, that was like interesting name. It's, you know, like the Prince of Wales, like the royals, the, the British royalty sure i've been watching the crown i knew what that meant but then i started digging more and the first thing i noticed is that this pattern was not available online it was part of a book that was already out of print so you know, kind of hit a wall there and i was like eh, well i'm not gonna find this book um maybe there's another version of this letter that i can find and that's when i went into a rabbit hole <laughs> so this sweater turns out is one of the most famous parts of knitwear history that exists out there, at least in the Western world. It is a sweater that the actual Prince of Ed Edward, Prince of Wales, and if, if you're not huge history buff or royals, you know, obsessed, which I'm not either of those things, but I watched The Crown. <laughs> That's where all my, my, you know, history comes from. This is the same Prince of Wales that became King Edward and then abdicated the throne to be with his lover who was, uh, I think, a divorcee and American. You know, recent history, really. That Prince of Wales, and then and as I started investigating more and like just reading history about this, and probably every British person watching this is like, you didn't know this? I mean, no, no, I didn't. I didn't, I did not go to school for wear fashion. So I am learning all of this as I'm like going through this rabbit hole of like, I just want to make this vest. What it is, is the pattern that I found, it was a reproduction of the actual vest that the Prince of Wales wore in a portrait done by um, 
Sir Henry Lander. This was a portrait of him in his golfing attire. He's holding this little puppy <laughs> in the portrait. Apparently, when this portrait came out, everyone just went crazy about this. This was in 1921. Some sources put it in 1922, but around that time, early 1920s, he, he had this portrait done and it just kind of stirred a crazy fad during the early 1920s, at least in the Western world, for Fair Isle knitting. So as I looked up more, like knitting, of course, has been very popular in many parts of the world for a very long time. Before that, you know, during the First World War, especially, and World War II, but during the First World War, a lot of people were knitting for the troops. And I, um, I found a lot of knitting patterns for the 1920s and before, you know, researching and looking and, and curiosity. And it's true that there is, there is no lot of um, Fair Isle going on. Again, talking about the British, not talking about other cultures, just like Western British American. There weren't that many, or if not any, Fair Isle sweaters in all of this you know, magazines uh, that at least that I'm able to to find online. And then in the 1920s, right after like the early 1920s, around the time this portrait was made, suddenly there's tons of Fair Isle patterns, sweaters and, and other types of vests and other types of garments, mostly for women. I think the whole idea of the 1920s man golfing, wearing a sweater, wearing the baggy pants, wearing a hat, that I was thinking of when I was, you know, thinking of the classic golfing outfit that I could make my husband, literally came from this portrait. So I found the source and said, yeah, that looks like the right pattern. <laughs> uh, uh, I I, and I became obsessed with this. Like I couldn't find anything else that even come close to the pattern than in the, what I was picturing. I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna make this. I need to make this. I don't know. I think I understand why people in the 1920s went crazy for this. It's just such a good vest. I found online, and again, my English uh, viewers, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I found that these type of vests, as we call it in the US, are called tank tops in England, which I think is hilarious because in, you know, in the US, tank tops are like summer outfits. Yeah, he, he literally popularized them and just exploded suddenly the, the, uh, the whole idea of uh, Fair Isle sweaters. And, and you know, Fair Isle sweaters are now kind of almost like the first thing that people think about when they think of knitting, I would think. Even if you have like zero knowledge about knitting, I feel like you would probably picture this type of sweater. So anyway, going back to my project, I was way into deep not to make this now. My next problem was finding this book. And it turns out it wasn't actually that hard to find. Yes, it's out of print, so I couldn't buy it new, but I was able to find it in a secondhand online bookstore. But I think it was like $6 or something like that. So I bought this entire book just for this pattern. And here it is. It is called Folk Bests by Cheryl Overall. It's basically a bunch, it's 25 knitting patterns from around the world. So it's not just you know, British, but they're literally around the world. It's kind of fascinating. They're all sweater vests, <laughs> all of them, which is like a very specific thing. But I guess now I have a lot of sweaters that I could knit my husband and I have the one that I wanted. But it is called, like I said, the Prince of Wales slip over. And there it is, the exact same image that drew my, drew my eye uh, of that sweater vest. And as it says here, it has like a little history that says that Yes, in the early 1920s, this is this cost like the rage for fashion. Just this one portrait that was done, even though apparently, according to this book, uh, the colors on the portrait aren't quite exactly the same as the real life sweater that the that the prince was wearing. I guess the the the, the artist took some liberties. It does look great. I had my pattern, and now just gotta figure out. I had to figure out what yarn I'm gonna use because the yarn that she mentions in the pattern. I mean, this is from 2000. This book is from like the early 2000s. And I tried, I tried to get the exact same yarn, but I think it just doesn't exist anymore and I couldn't find it. So I had to make do and basically just eyeball the colors to yarn that I was available for me. So if you watch earlier videos, I did this haul from Knit Picks when they had their big sale in November and I got a bunch of colors. So that's what this was for. I tried to 
just kind of eyeball as much as I could to get the colors right. So I got all of the yarn that I got is palette from Knit Picks, Finger and Weight. And I got this Coriander Heather as the base of my sweater. I again, I just kind of went on and, and found different colors like the yellow, green. There's def different shades of red. There are quite a few shades. I was actually surprised because some of them are not like as ap ap just obvious when you're looking at the pattern or at the picture. But there's a lot of cute little details and I'll go into that a little bit more. So another green, another red. So yeah, I, I, a lot of yarn. I cast it on and started this sweater. I didn't get very far yet, but I, I hope to show you what I have so far. A few interesting things about this pattern as I went. The first one was that I didn't realize this as I, until I started knitting it, but the um, the bottom, the edges of the vest, both both the bottom and later in the neck and the arm, they are just a simple, you know, two by two ribbing. But because you change colors so that all the knits are the base color and all the pearls are green and actually two tones of green, it gives it a very interesting look. And even like the texture of it is different from, because it's color work, but it's also ribbing. I've never seen anything like that. It is very interesting and fun. And then you basically follow a chart. There's only three sizes. I feel like they were all men's sizes when I measured it. In general, this book doesn't have a lot of very variation sizes. I don't think any of them would fit me maybe. I would have to like really make changes to them to make it work. It's fine. <laughs> this definitely fits my husband. I measured it. So yeah, so you follow a color chart and kind of repeat one chart and then the next and then go back to the first one and then the next. I just finished my first chart and you can already see. Again, the colors might not be exact, but it look it's looking pretty good so far, I think. I think I did a good job eyeballing it. But the next thing about this pattern that I didn't realize until after I started was that, of course, this is color work and it is a vest. So it's gonna require some sticking, which I've never done. I don't know what that is. Basically, it means that I am going to knit this uh, without any holes for the arms or the neck. And then when it's done or at some point in the pattern, I have to stick, which means cutting. It's knit in a way that you're supposed to be able to cut and it doesn't like mess it all up, but you cut the holes. So scary. I, I've never ever done a pattern like this. This is way out of my comfort zone for sure, but I am already way too deep and, and I am going to do it. So this pattern is gonna just be a lot of challenges for me and a lot of fun new things. This is how I feel at the moment. I'm excited and scared. Well, excited and scared. So hopefully I can finish it on time to gift it to him to his birthday. First I was like, I'll finish it for Christmas. Then Christmas went by. Yeah, I guess I'll see you guys on the other side. Wish me luck. And thanks for going on this rabbit hole with me. See you on the next part. One eternity later. All right, we're well, here we are back at the other end of this project. I finished it. I cannot believe I finished it because I don't think in that first part that I quite knew what I was getting into when I started this project. I knew it was going to be different and more difficult and that it was going to be like, you know, quite... An endeavor but then when I was actually in it there was a lot that I was doing that was new and different and in the end it turned out I think pretty good so I'm gonna I'm about to show you I'm about to show you but first just want to kind of walk you through all the things that I went through with this vest something that I mean I knew the color work was gonna be challenging to a point because of all the different colors and the changes of the repetition but it wasn't so much that it was hard. It was more that it needed a lot of concentration. I had to actually be looking a lot into the chart and, and not, you know, watch TV and do other things. And also because it is a men's size or it's like a 42 inch chest that I'm not not used to making as often. I usually make my own size, which is a lot smaller than that. So I think I did not imagine how long each row was gonna take how long each repeat, how many times I have to repeat the pattern of the color work. And also the fact that almost the entire sweater is color work, like even the ribbing in the neck and the, the hem and, and the 
where the sleeves would be the, the armholes. Even that has color work in it. There's only like a few rows where you're knitting with only one color and everything else is color work. So yeah, it's like the whole way through you have to be paying attention to it. But it was it was fun. I kind of get got into a rhythm eventually. That took me the longest time to get to where the separation of the sleeves would go of the speak. Up until I got to the point where the, there was decreases and then the rounds became a little shorter and it just kind of went faster. Before that, it just felt like it took forever. But it was pretty straightforward. It's just color work. It wasn't until the stick that I had to started sweating. There wasn't the the book did have a bit of a description on how to do the stick and and what the whole thing was, but I did have to look into a few videos just to make sure I was doing everything right. That I was alternating colors, uh, where the cut would be so that the the color strands would not fall apart. I guess one thing that <laughs> once I show you, there is a big mistake. I didn't notice it like kind of saw it coming but I didn't quite see it up and up until it was already separated and I think it's because once you stick and you're cutting uh, the you know the the front two parts for example on the side of the v-neck kind of become separated and it's more obvious how each side is different and that's when I noticed that the front panels on either side of the neck are not the same size I don't know how I did it. I really don't know. I at some point I must have decreased on one side and not the other, or or decreased more on the back than on the front. And I don't know. I think it was the decreases where I I somehow because I'm pretty sure I counted correctly because when where you see the V neck start that is in the right in the middle, but then it kind of goes a little bit to the side. It's not super noticeable. It's only like hmm, less than an inch, um, kind of on the. I, like just one part is a little bigger it doesn't look bad when you're wearing it and that's what I tell myself it is not terrible but I see it and I'm kind of annoyed that I didn't notice it until after I'd done it but it's not bad enough that I would like not wear it or not give it to my husband to wear I think it's fine for my first stick now I know what to look for before I cut it the sticking itself, I made a video, I made a little reel about it if you didn't catch it. Would you cut your knitting? It was like, it was just kind of encapsulating that feeling, that fear, that kind of like, oh my gosh, I've never done this before. I never cut into my knitting. I always kind of saw it as, as not just terrifying because it might fall apart, but almost like sacrilegious. How could you be cutting into it? Uh, I kind of get it now. It did make with all that color work it didn't make just continue knitting and not doing any back and forth so much easier so i kind of i get why you do the stick it still was very nerve-wracking and i think everything i put into that that tiktok real video <laughs> just yeah it was really the way i was feeling the book called for machine reinforcement like with the sewing machine and i'm really glad i did that because there when i was looking online there was also crochet reinforcement and i think i literally just didn't feel like finding my crochet hooks and trying that i i don't know i think i just i was like yeah the machine looks fine that's what the book says that's what i'll do but then after I after I machine stitched and everything was fine and then I cut and everything was fine, something was nagging me. I could tell that if you just pull a little bit, the, the, the stitches could come out. And then when I posted that reel into Instagram, somebody mentioned uh, that you could also felt the edges of your stick. So that got into my head and first I went back and I actually did the crochet reinforcement after the fact that I had already cut the stick. Nothing came off, but it was getting a little, I don't know. I, I couldn't tell that that was really doing much. So after I did that, I kept thinking about it as I started picking up the stitches for the sleeves and it was fine. Sometimes it would almost come off and I'd be like, ah, very, did very slowly, very carefully. But I knew like this is gonna be worn by my husband. He's not gonna be careful about putting his arms through it or pulling it or whatever. And I don't know if it's gonna hold or not. It seemed to be holding. In my anxiety then, I bought some felting tools and I never felt it before. So I, it, I found like an inexpensive kit that had both the pad and the felting tool and on Etsy, I think, and it got to me pretty quickly. So I got 
to felting the edges and that really really works it made me feel so much better because you can see that once it's felted that the, there's no way the stitches are coming off they're just kind of bend that the, they're bound together and although it added a little bit of bulk in the air to have the felt it's not super noticeable and i thought it'll probably be even less noticeable once i block it so i went for it and I think it was a good idea. I really think it worked. And if anything, it gave me peace of mind. I don't think it's gonna fall off anymore. It looks pretty tight in there. I think after that, it, it was all about, you know, picking up the stitches for the neck and the, and the sides of the armhole. And then I just blocked it, which did help a lot, but it made me feel really good to see that my tension was even enough. It was already pretty flat, the tension, it was pretty, good all over so the blocking did make the draping a little nicer and, and and it helped especially with those stitches that i had picked up but in general it looked pretty much the same so i feel i feel really good that i guess the one thing i got out of this project is that i am very good at color work tension and i was very happy with the result i went ahead and weaved a lot of ends i did weave a bit before i had finished and then a bit before I blocked, but kind of divided it in three blocks of weaving. But still there were a lot, <laughs> there's a lot of colors. And at some point when I was knitting, I tried just leaving the color there and not cutting it, but I didn't like how it was kind of pulling on it. The previous row, even if I left like a longer strand in between, I don't know, it kind of didn't work the same as the color work on the stitches to the side, as like, up and down i didn't like it so i just kept adding new strands every time which it gave me a lot of ends so yes i finished it here it is cannot believe how much work went into this and you can kind of see what i was saying that this part's a little smaller than this part i think the longer part is the wrong one it is not super noticeable it is noticeable enough for me that this side is a little larger than this side but once you're wearing it, it's also not that obvious and honestly, just because I pointed it out. In the end, I am really happy with how it came out. Uh, even looking at the inside, just, I don't know, it just makes me feel so good to see that perfect tension. From the moment that I saw a picture of this sweater vest, I love the color combination. And it's funny because I was, like I said, I was saying earlier, I was looking for this specific type of color work men's vest that to me was like you know 1920s ball thing just the idea of it and then i went and made the one that even brought that idea into the ether under <laughs> the culture ether which is the the one the prince of wales was wearing so i i'm glad that i ended up it kind of feels like a circle back to the beginning that i ended up making this uh and and i don't know i think i would make more vests it's kind of fun you know, to have to, to worry too much about sleeves. It looks really cute on him. I haven't taken a picture yet. I think I'm waiting until we go visit my parents who have a dog so that I can recreate the picture of the Prince of Wales and the dog and the hat and everything. I think we're gonna do that because um, why not? <laughs> but in the meantime, that is how I came to make this sweater vest. This is the one that I think still is the best the best one in the book and yeah if you're interested in looking at this this book uh folk vests i will put a link to hopefully like i said this is this is out of print so maybe i'll find something that is second hand and hopefully you can get it from there that's what i did if you're interested in making this one i i do recommend the pattern itself is really easy to follow um you, you should just do some searching for sticking on your own because the explanation there is very very simple but the charts themselves and how to make the sweater was quite easy to follow so i do recommend the pattern and yeah i don't think i've seen any other reproduction of this vest that looks as good as this one uh, am i gonna make any other sticking projects after this I think I will. Maybe not right away. I think I need a little break from color work and I am knitting something else already that does not involve color work because I think, yeah, it's 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 been a little too much of it between this project and this sweater that I'm wearing. It I deserve a little break and trying to do something different, but at some point, definitely if I do another color work 
garment that involves leaves and, and a neck, I might go for the sticking again. I don't know. I, I'm not as afraid now. And now I have my felting kit, so I will go straight for felting next time. I guess this was, this ended up being a historical knitting adventure. I am interested in knitting more actual vintage patterns. But in the meantime, if you're interested on 1920s fashion for women, I have made a couple of 1920s sewing patterns that were actually vintage. And maybe next time that I go to a 1920s party with my outfit, I'll, I'll have my husband wear this one too. Hope you enjoy. See you on the next one and happy vintage knitting.